All right, well, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today, Patterns of Harmful Algal Blooms and Associated Toxins in Cayuga Lake. I'm just gonna go over some rules and reminders for the webinar ahead. So all participants will be muted upon entry. And if you haven't been muted automatically, we please request that you mute yourself until the presentations are over. During the discussion period, we will uh, set it so that you can unmute yourself to ask a question. Um, but throughout the webinar, we ask that you use the chat function to ask your questions and we'll be collecting them. And then to start off the discussion section, we'll be calling upon people to unmute themselves uh, and ask their questions in turn. So just trying to keep it as organized as possible. We've got a lot of participants today, which is great. Um, one final reminder is that if your internet connection is poor, uh, please just consider turning your video off and that should help tremendously. All right, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stephen Penningroth, Executive Director at the Community Science Institute for the introduction to the webinar. Oh, uh, so I just pressed on share screen and it says this will stop other screen sharing. Do you want to continue? So is that, that's a yes, right? That's a yes, yep. Okay, thank you. All right, and now, Okay, there we go. Okay, here we go. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Penningroth. I'm the Executive Director of the Community Science Institute. And I'm really glad that you all can be here this afternoon. Uh, CSI Community Science Institute has been partnering uh, with volunteers to monitor harmful algal blooms uh, on Cayuga Lake for the past three years. And our, the goal, uh, goals of our monitoring program are, are twofold. One is to keep the public informed in near real time about where HABs are occurring on the Cayuga Lake shore and their toxicity. And the second goal is to collect data that can reveal patterns and help in, inform strategies for managing the risk from HABs over the long term. So our, our HABs monitoring program operates along two separate tracks. And one track I'll call the public health track. Uh, our 90 plus HABs Harrier volunteers patrol the shoreline and collect samples of blooms for analysis in the CSI lab. Uh, so that's our very large uh, volunteer monitoring partnership with our HABs Harrier volunteers. And the second track is what I'll call the ecology track. And that consists of CSI's biomonitoring uh, coordinator conducting regular surveys of the populations of several different types of cyanobacteria under non-bloom conditions uh, at eight locations, eight fixed locations uh, around uh, Cayuga Lake. So our HABs monitoring program would not be possible without our many, many dedicated volunteers, and two of them uh, will lead us off now. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, Shelley and Sai. Well, we thank you. I'm Shelley. <laughs> and, and I'm Sai. And we do want to thank CSI for including us in the presentation and, of course, for the important work that you're doing. Uh, our plan is that I'll talk a little bit about our location on the lake, and then Shelley will walk you through a couple of the HABs we've been able to sample this year. So if the gods are good, I can share a screen. <laughs> so this is where we're located on the, on the water at the north end of the village of Cayuga. The zone that we monitor for CSI starts here at the railroad bridge and goes up the eastern shore for a distance of about two miles up to Mudlock where we connect to the canal system. Uh, you'll notice the proximity of Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge and you should also notice this chain of islands which makes this part of the lake really different than the rest of the lake. It's quite sheltered and we'll also mention that it's quite shallow. I should say that uh, this year we've also had another HAB Harrier 
who's been able to help us monitor the southern end of our zone. For reference, uh, this is a, an Apple Maps uh, satellite image, but what we can see along our zone, there's a marina, a long string of private homes, uh, the locals call them camps, a couple more marinas up to Mudlock. You can also see that the part of the lake is entirely surrounded by marsh area. It really is uh, quite pristine. Uh, the other thing I should mention about this image that I like is you can see the dramatic difference along the channel. That that's the only part where this lake has, or this part of the lake has any depth at all. Uh, the rest of it is really quite shallow. Here's uh, a water level image. You can see the railroad bridge. Uh, this one is Beacon Bay Marina and the beginning of this string of homes along the shoreline. I'll also point out that the water is remarkably calm, which is not so unusual. It's very nice for those of us who like to kayak. Uh, it's also very attractive to our algae blooms. Uh, just for reference, the opposite shore, this is a piece of the island. You can see the, the marshland and further up, uh, a very nice environment. Uh, this is, Shelley's going to show you a lot of pictures of, uh, of algae blooms, but this one will show you that it's not always the case that uh, Viewed from our dock, uh, on some days the water is crystal clear and you can see great detail. It's quite shallow here as well. This is a, an image from, from mid-January. At this point, they've lowered the level of the lake a little more than three feet. And so much of our shoreline is, is exposed. Uh, you can get a sense of how gradual the slope of the bottom of the lake is here. Uh, We've only got about 18 inches of water here at our bulkhead. And in fact, we could walk all the way out to the channel if we were so inclined. Uh, the other thing I'll mention in this image is the sediment that begins out here, which we imagine is a nutrient-rich sediment that really covers the floor of the lake all the way out uh, through this part of the lake. Uh, for reference, uh, a bit later in the season, uh, this is about a month later, you can see the shallow water is iced over. The channel up here mostly stays open uh, and we do have some of our favorite visitors. Um, here we're focusing again on our house, but what I want to point out in this image is the amount of plant material that seems to be accumulating in our shoreline. It's a feature of where we live, that things accumulate here. And uh, to some extent, we've been able to make use of it. This is uh, early in the season. We've collected, uh, this is sago pondweed, which we've got in great abundance. Uh, we've made use of it for compost and mulch. Uh, and it's a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, later in the season, we've been able to continue to collect. This is uh, an eelgrass, which dominates later. Uh, for reference, on windy days, we don't see the algae blooms, but we do, things still accumulate, and one of the things that some folks are interested in is this foam, which we understand some people think may be related to the, to the blooms. Uh, so this is an image from a CSI report. Uh, this is our part of the lake way up here. And what you see is we have an embarrassing number of blooms that we were able to sample this year. And Shelley will talk about some of those. The first bloom I wanted to call to your attention today is our very early in the season, right pretty much at the beginning at, on July 6th, this was our bloom number two. And our habit when we monitor our zone is to paddle out into the middle of the lake and straight to the north end and then slowly come back down along the shoreline where we expect to see blooms starting. 
but before we got to the north end or toward the shoreline, we were already seeing a bloom beginning. And this was in the still water trapped among the plentiful sago pond weed, uh, which is proliferating from year to year. And it was a very hot, sunny day, and it was happening quickly. As we approached the shoreline at Mudlock, uh, we could see the, the hab was starting to make streaks along the shore. And continuing south, by the time we got to Cuga Marina, it was quite intense, and that's where we decided to sample. And further down the shoreline, it was also bad at Lockview Marina. And by the time we got back to our own shoreline around noon, we could see it was beginning to happen there also. Uh, by a little after one, this is what it looked like in our neighbor's inlet. Because it seemed to be such a pervasive bloom, we did check out Harris Park Beach, even though it's not part of our, our zone. It's just a little to the south of us. And it was also quite bad there. Luckily, the beach was closed. So the results from Bloom 2, this shows that it had dense microcystis, which I understand is unusual for that early in the season. And it had a high chlorophyll and also a uh, significant toxicity. The second bloom I want to show you was later that month, on July 30th, bloom number eight. Uh, the notable things about this bloom was that it started very early in the morning. We often see incipient blooms early, before seven o'clock sometimes, uh, but this one by a little after eight was looking quite intense. And this was where we sampled from our neighbor's inlet at that time. The other thing that's notable about this bloom was that it persisted into the next day. Uh, we have a little trouble sometimes distinguishing when one bloom ends and another begins. Uh, so the rule of thumb that we've been using is 24 hours without detecting a bloom. Uh, this was clearly the same bloom. And looking out from our dock at, at that time on the second day, you can see how far out it extends into the lake. Uh, there are times actually when this whole end of the lake has kind of a greenish cast. And here we show from the, the master results table at CSI, the dense microcystis was also characteristic of this bloom. It had an even higher chlorophyll and a scary number for the microcystin toxin. So it's an attractive place that we live in. Uh, it's attractive to birds and wildlife and to people like us who like the gentle waters to paddle around. Uh, but it's also uh, conducive to haves with the sheltered, shallow, warm, uh, relatively calm, and we think nutrient-rich water. Uh, so to conclude, we, we do have concerns about the lake as a whole and about our little corner of it, but it's still a beautiful place. And just to point out more of the beauty, we'll show a few of Shelley's images of the many, many sunsets you get to watch if you live here. And it is an environment that is worth nurturing. And uh, we are grateful to scientists for helping us find out how to be better stewards. And now we'll turn you over to an actual scientist, Adriana. Unmute myself first. Thank you so much, Shelly and Sai. That was really great to get that perspective. And you have such a beautiful slide here and sunset that I <laughs> loathe to put and bring my screen up, but I am will do that. Here we go. Okay, another view from the south end of Cayuga Lake. So what I'm hoping to do in my short time with you is just take you on a little um, tour of what we do with the, the second bullet point that Steve mentioned earlier, kind of looking at the ecology of the lake um, through the monitoring program, looking at non-bloom times and what we see in the waters, um, cyanobacteria and otherwise, we're gonna focus mainly on cyanobacteria and show some pictures. 
So to start off with, um, there are always multiple perspectives on any view of the lake. And you guys just saw some photos of some intense blooms up at the north end of the lake um, near Shelley and Sai's dock. And I, I labeled this Shelley and Sai's dock, but I realize now that um, this, the photos that you showed were also of other places and you may have sampled in other places. So when I, we received the sample at CSI's lab, um, I take a drop of water from bloom samples and look at them, look at them under the microscope. So this was that um, early July bloom looked something like this. And of course, it's a whole wild landscape as you scan through. This is a couple millimeters um, field of view of what you might see. And this is microcystis, um, how it appears under the microscope. Each of those little dots are little individual cells that accumulate in these colonies. This was actually the later bloom. So you can see a little greater density of the microcystis and here probably three different species at least of microcystis. But what about on a day when you're not seeing much out there in terms of um, uh, cyanobacteria bloom? I know a lot of the HABS Harrier volunteers are really good at spotting um, the little flecks, the characteristic flecks that start to appear before you get enough accumulation of things like microcystis to form a bloom. Um, and sometimes if you look at that point, you can definitely still see colonies of microcystis. But on an average day on the lake when a uh, bloom isn't happening, if we just took a drop of lake water, um, we would have to search around quite a bit to see organisms. They're they tend to be more spread out. So in order to look at um, these non-bloom samples, we use a plankton net. And this is basically, you can imagine it as a sock made of mesh, really fine mesh. If you sawed off the, if you cut off the tip of the sock and you replaced it with a sawed off water bottle top with a little lid that you can remove. And the other end of the sock is like a metal ring that keeps it held open. And this is all attached to a rope. There's a little weight on the bottle end. And in order to collect our plankton samples, we throw our plankton net out um, about three meters, pull it back, I'll do that 10 times along the surface of the water. You can also get really fancy plankton nets and use them to sample at depth and have it close while it's down underwater and pull your sample up. But we've been mainly focusing with our surveys on, on what's happening right near the surface. So the mesh size that we use is um, 53 microns, which is, Pretty small. Um, if you go any smaller than that, things tend to get clogged up. Um, but just to give you a sense, there's about in one micron, there's, uh, or in one millimeter, there's about a thousand microns. And here's an example of a um, microcystis colony being trapped by the mesh of my net. That's about how, um, a, if this is like 300 microns across this colony, it, this is about what that would look like. Um, caught on the mesh. So basically the uh, material accumulates in the bottle at the bottom of the net. And this is a slightly different model than the one that we use the, in the picture. Um, but then you take the bottle off at the bottom and we pour it into another sample container, bring it back to the lab and take a drop out of it. This sample that you see is a little thicker than kind of a normal non-bloom conditions. This was actually a sample, that I, I took this picture just a couple days ago. It's a leftover sample from July where it was bloom conditions many places on the lake. This was a sample from Cayuga Lake State Park where it was sort of pre-bloom conditions. And when you concentrate it, it gets pretty thick like that. Now this smells really terrible. I wish I could project the smell to you <laughs> of opening this jar. But basically um, I just wanted to show this idea of taking a drop, and then we look at it under the microscope. This is not that same sample. This is from the Wells College doc from our summer surveys. And if you're getting familiar with recognizing microcystis, you could see that there are some microcystis there. Microcystis tends to look a little darker um, and less colorful than some of the green algae, like this pediastrum, this colony of pediastrum up here. Um, the reason that microcystis and some of the other cyanobacteria that we find in the lake um, tend to be less look less colorful is because they have aerotopes in them, these little gas vesicles that allow them to regulate their buoyancy and move up and down in the water column. 
Here's some Dolichospermum. So this is another common bloom-forming cyanobacteria that we find in Cayuga Lake. This is an interesting picture because the center of it has an accumulation of aconites, which is sort of a resting stage for cyanobacteria, for some cyanobacteria. So they can, um, when conditions are not so great for them, they can go into this sort of resting form and then kind of come back later when things look better. So just um, to give a brief introduction to what are cyanobacteria, um, Microcystis and Dolichospermum are the main uh, bloom-forming cyanobacteria that we have in Cay we find in Cayuga Lake. We do find um, some other bloom-forming cyanobacteria, but typically um, these are the ones that are dominating the blooms. And the Microcystis um, blooms tend to be associated more with the Microcystin toxin that we find at the lab. So cyanobacteria um, are prokaryotic organisms, so they have no nuclei, and they're very ancient. They've been around since early Earth. You could basically say that cyanobacteria invented photosynthesis, or at least the type of photosynthesis that we're familiar with, where carbon dioxide is taken in and then oxygen is given off as a waste product. They're actually much more efficient than green plants at doing photosynthesis and giving off oxygen. So, um, and, and it turns out that green plants, um, the chloroplasts in them were originally free living cyanobacteria that through symbioses now are in the leaves of all plants. So all photosynthesis on earth, you can thank these um, cyanobacteria. And they're everywhere and everywhere where there's water, um, even water in the air sometimes can have cyanobacteria. Um, in it, in it um, they do some really interesting things. So um, some of them, as I've mentioned, um, and including both of these um, microcystis and dolichospermum, they have aerotopes so that they can regulate their buoyancy moving up and down in the water column, depending on how much sun they want to get in particular conditions. Um, they also, um, dolichospermum, has a different sort of structure than the microcystis. Microcystis cells are all kind of clumped together in these colonies, and dolichospermum tends to form more of these necklace structures. Sometimes they're tangled, sometimes they're neat little um, spirals. But dolichospermum also produces both the aconites that I've mentioned already, these sort of resting cells, and also heterocytes, special cells where they fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, there aren't many organisms on Earth that can do that, um, and they are able to then um, utilize that um, nitrogen that's abundant in the atmosphere but can be a limiting nutrient for growth. Um, oh boy, it's so hard. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I could talk for I could talk for a day probably about cyanobacteria, and this is the danger of my uh, of me going too long. But I just want to make sure I cover some of the basic pieces of this. One other important factor I think to understand about cyanobacteria is that they don't reproduce sexually. Um, so that the way that they um, reproduce, they are sort of clones of each other, but they are able to sort of mix DNA um, in a way that bacteria does, which is um, they can basically essentially by bumping into each other can share DNA, which is very different than organisms like us who have all their DNA packed neatly into nuclei. So um, for example, the creation of toxins can be shared um, between different species sometimes when so not all microcystis may be producing microcystin toxin, but um, they, they can do it and potentially they could even share that information with other um, cyanobacteria. Okay, now I'm going to move on because uh, Dolichospermum and Microcystis are not the only cyanobacteria. This is actually a close-up of Microcystis still lingering there, um, but I like the picture because it shows, um, gives a little bit of a sense of the aerotopes, which are actually very hard to see sometimes under the microscope. You're looking kind of almost for a little glint of red gleaming out, um, but it helps you identify Microcystis and some of these other um, bloom-forming cyanobacterias. Here's a nice photo of Dolichospermum where you can see the heterocytes and aconites. Another one with heterocytes, slightly different form. And then um, there are other cyanobacterias that we see out there. Um, and while none of them have been our main bloom-forming cyanobacteria now, um, who knows if that could change at some point in the future. Oscillatoria um, 
are really interesting. They're filamentous. It's this little sort of snake-like thing coming out of the bottom. And I say snake-like because when you see these under the microscope, they actually do slither across um, your field of view. They have a way of secreting substances that make it so that they can move. It's really kind of fascinating. But oscillatoria are known toxin producers. They're not, um, they don't have aerotopes. So typically they're sort of benthic or dwelling on the bottom. Although this summer at East Shore Park, I started seeing clumps that were oscillatoria floating on the surface. So maybe through the oxygen that they're producing, creating little air bubbles, they're able to float on the surface at times. And back in 2019, there were like three dog deaths um, in one day on this particular pond in North Carolina, and they were associating those deaths with oscillatoria. Here's some more oscillatoria from this past summer at East Shore Park. Um, and um, there's another cyanobacteria that looks really similar to oscillatoria, but it actually does have aerotopes and it can be bloom forming. There are places um, where I've seen blooms, not in our area, but other places um, formed by limnorhaphis, also produces some different toxins. And this one has a sheath around it, so that otherwise it looks very similar to oscillatoria. And um, this is some more limnorhaphis in midst some uh, microcystis. A phanazomenon has this interesting way of, uh, they're filamentous, but they also form these clumps. Um, and we've seen um, an aphanazomenon bloom in a local pond um, recently. And lastly, of the cyanobacteria that I'm going to um, show to you today, a Marismopedia is a really fun one to find. And I'm not aware of it forming blooms, but it's like these little computer microchips or something in the way that they reproduce and are just beautiful. And then there's a little fragilaria up there in the corner. So our plankton net surveys um, happened roughly every two weeks between the time periods listed here um, in both the bloom season of uh, 2019 and 2020. So these were the locations where we've been sampling. The locations were chosen because they were easily accessible and most of them are public locations. Um, public parks and such. And we thought that that would also be more relevant to people spending time on the lake, um, knowing what's happening in those areas. Um, the, let's see. This um, is an example of some of the results in terms of looking at the cyanobacteria that we've seen um, in at the different locations. So um, the size of the little dots um, corresponds to whether samples were sort of dense, moderate, or sparse with uh, those particular cyanobacteria. And I'd encourage you to check out the um, CSI Water Bulletin, which is on the website. Um, for, if you want to look at this closer, we also explain how we determine the difference between dense, moderate, and sparse. But you can see that in the summer of 2019, this pattern started to creep up where there was really dense microcystis typically at the north end of the lake. So these three locations up here. So Shelly and Sai's dock is right up um, and up here. And then it's still very shallow in this whole part of the lake up um, in here. And it just got to be this normal thing that when I'd go around the lake doing taking my samples, I just sort of expected and was not was uh, usually not surprised by what I saw um, moving around the lake. And occasionally there were other um, dominant uh, species in, that we saw. Now just, I have to emphasize that these are plankton net samples. So when I talk about dense microcystis in the plankton net samples, it's not the same thing as dense microcystis in a drop of water from one of the samples that a volunteer brought into the lake. Those are bloom conditions. Most of the time these were not bloom conditions, but occasionally we got conditions as well. Um, in 2020, things look different. I was rather surprised that rather than just finding um, the concentrations, the heavy concentrations of microcystis at the north end of the lake, we found them pretty much everywhere at different times. Um, and so if you put look at those two years side by side, there's this sort of interesting, almost pattern, or we've been calling it as cyanobacteria signatures that we've been um, seeing in the lake. Um, and this corresponds interestingly to um, the toxin, um, the high toxin blooms that um, Steve will talk about later that in 2019, 
tended to mostly be at the north end of the lake. And in 2020, we also saw them um, in other parts of the lake. I'm just going to wrap up with um, a, a note on, I think I'm sure all of the CSI's Hab Terrier volunteers are well aware that there's much um, to be gained from just that process of observation. I'm sure if we could talk to all of our volunteers, we'd hear stories about the things that they noticed because they were out there looking for cyanobacteria. And I would say the same thing about this plankton survey. It's really interesting, even just the process of driving around the lake um, every two weeks and the things that you see. I saw times when um, there were fish kills up at the north end of the lake that I never would have otherwise known about or um, in um, some heavy construction that was happening right on the lake shore that could potentially um, influence what's going on in different areas. And you kind of know that when you see those things and when you're out in the field. And um, in terms of the plankton surveys, I think one of the most important things um, to remember about all of this, when um, we're thinking about harmful algal blooms and the cyanobacteria in our area that are causing them, is that the cyanobacteria aren't out there in a vacuum. They're a natural part of our lake ecosystems. It's unusual, perhaps, that we're seeing around the world greater concentrations of these uh, appearing in different areas but it's not happening in a vacuum. There's a whole lot of other life out there and it's all connected um, one to the other. And I'm going to end with some photos of some other things that I've seen out there just to remind us that, you know, as we're thinking about harmful algal blooms, that there's a whole lot going on out there in the lake. So um, microcystis around the outside, you might be looking under your slide at something like this and all of a sudden um, somebody like Caratella, the rotifer pops in Here's a better photo uh, image of them. They're really beautiful, hard to photograph though. Or something crazy like this. Here's a close up of, yes, that actually is its eye. <laughs> and Volvox, um, these are kind of classic microorganisms that Van Leeuwenhoek back in the 1700s um, recorded and seeing under his, micros his early microscopes. And they're a colonial green algae or spirogyra, which is a conjugating green algae. They have these spiral chloroplasts that go around um, the cells and they're actually ancestors. We've learned somewhat recently that these are ancestors of our land plants, green plants. And Mugotia also, they have these really cool chloroplasts that are plate-like. Bosmina, who's kind of the charismatic megafauna of the micro world. <laughs> really cool zooplankton serratium that photosynthesize and move. There are a lot of organisms like that. They not only photosynthesize, but they can eat things as well. And the uh, diatoms, which this tabularia is really beautiful. These are like little glass boxes um, made of silica um, that are very common in the lake, especially in the winter, if you were to go out there right now. And um, lastly, Asterionella, this, uh, another amazing diatom that's out there. I'm going to leave you with this picture that hopefully I can make become a video. Um, this is an Esplankna, another rotifer. Uh, it was a rare occasion where it must have gotten trapped and it's damaged in some way. So I was actually able to look at it up close in one place for a while, just reminding us that that lake is a living organism itself with all these living, breathing parts of it. So thank you. I will turn it over to the next presenter. Great, thank you, Adriana. And I also wanna start by saying thank you to Shelly and Sai and all of our other Habs Harrier volunteers, many of whom are with us today, uh, without whom this program wouldn't be possible and who really make a huge contribution to helping monitor Habs and protecting Cayuga Lake. So today I'll be providing an overview of our volunteer harmful algal bloom monitoring program and some of the results from our 2020 uh, Bloom Monitoring Program. So, so far we have discussed types of cyanobacteria found in Cayuga Lake, and we have seen examples of what harmful algal blooms are and why they can be so damaging and disruptive to lakeshore homeowners. Uh, but 
what is a harmful algal bloom? Um, and it's hard to kind of describe, but harmful algal blooms, or HABs for short, are the rapid growth of cyanobacteria populations or the accumulation of cyanobacteria concentrated to a local area. Uh, they can often look like uh, pea green soup or surface scums on the water, like those pictures that Shelly and Sai showed you. Um, and this means that those intense blooms that was shown during their presentation are the result of the dense accumulation of the individual cyanobacteria cells and colonies that Adriana was showing pictures of. Now these blooms are called harmful because cyanobacteria can produce toxins as we've discussed and those toxins can be present at high concentrations uh, during these dense accumulations. They're also called harmful because they can damage the local economy by, for instance, disrupting tourism and recreation, and because they can cause ecological damage and disruption. Now this rapid growth or accumulation is different than the modest growth that occurs as part of a natural seasonal cycle. Shown below is a simplified chart showing the natural seasonal succession of phytoplankton populations, including cyanobacteria, in freshwater lakes throughout the year. And you can see that different types of phytoplankton, their population naturally tends to increase uh, throughout the year, and that the population of cyanobacteria in a lake naturally tends to increase right around the summer months. Um, but again, this natural increase in population in a lake is still far lower than kind of the spike in population or the dense accumulation of cyanobacteria that results in what we call a harmful algal bloom. And the factors that promote these blooms are still under study um, and they can be numerous, but there is general scientific consensus that cyanobacteria population growth increases at higher water temperatures uh, that nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen have been shown to promote cyanobacteria growth, and that still calm and stratified waters tend to facilitate the formation of dense surface blooms. Uh, on the flip side of that though, prevailing winds can sometimes lead to blooms uh, because they cause cyanobacteria to accumulate on specific shorelines. So in 2017, there were many reports of harmful algal blooms on Cayuga Lake, and this caused widespread concern about the health of the lake and the impacts that these blooms might be having. Uh, and in response to this emerging water quality threat, the Community Science Institute implemented the Cayuga Lake Harmful Algal Bloom Monitoring Program in collaboration with the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network and Discover Cayuga Lake. Now, the purpose of the program is twofold. The program serves to provide fast alerts and hazard warnings to the users of Cayuga's waters, but also to develop information about the occurrence of harmful algal blooms that might help us better understand their occurrence on Cayuga Lake um, in the future. And so the program is a partnership of these organizations and volunteers around the lake. And these volunteers, titled Habs Harriers, attend a two-hour training session in June where they learn how to identify harmful algal blooms and collect a sample. And then following this, they monitor a section of shoreline on the lake once per week from the start of July until the end of September. If they don't observe a bloom during their weekly survey, they file what's called a no bloom report, signaling that the shoreline is clear of harmful algal blooms. However, if they do observe a bloom, they report the date, the time, and the location immediately and also send pictures of the bloom. And then they also collect a sample of the bloom and transport it to CSI lab for analysis. Here at the lab, we test the blooms to determine the type of cyanobacteria that formed the bloom, uh, to measure the level of total chlorophyll A, which is a measure of bloom density and to measure the concentration of microcystin toxin. Now, as many of you may know, microcystin is considered to be the most common toxin associated with harmful algal blooms in New York State, and one for which the Department of Health has set uh, limits for safe recreation and finished drinking water. So the limit for microcystin in finished drinking water is 0.3 micrograms per liter, 
and the limit for microcystin in water used for recreation is four micrograms per liter. And it's really important to note that these limits are for water during non-bloom conditions. So you should never uh, get exposed to an active bloom. Active blooms are always dangerous regardless of their microcystin concentration because uh, cyanobacteria are known to produce other toxins which we don't yet have an, an accurate and rapid way to test for. So once a bloom report is received at CSI, uh, the description, the information provided by the volunteers, the photos, and the location are posted on our Cayuga Lake HABS reporting page on our website in near to real time. And this page contains an interactive map of the bloom locations and a table containing all of the information and the results of laboratory analyses. So the results of the analyses, uh, including the microcystin toxin measurement, is posted on the page within 24 to 72 hours of receiving a bloom sample. And uh, this rapid turnaround is really important uh, so that we can uh, get accurate information to uh, management decision makers and the public alike so that they can make safe decisions about recreating on the lake and using its waters. And then to further inform and alert communities around the lake about current and recent harmful algal blooms, the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network sends out weekly updates uh, in which they include uh, the most recent record of harmful algal blooms and the results of lab analyses and also uh, some really useful information about uh, local beach closer closures and anything else that you might need to know about the current status of harmful algal blooms on the lake. And each week, the bloom data collected through our program is also sent to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and they post this data on their statewide NIHABS reporting system so that people across the state and even across the country can be alert to when and where these blooms are happening. So over the past three years, our harmful algal blooms monitoring program has grown steadily. In 2020, over 90 volunteers participated in the program and they monitored 83 lakeshore zones which covered roughly 50% of the entire lakeshore on a weekly basis. Um, this past summer, our Cayuga Lake HABS reporting page received over 40,000 views, which demonstrates that it is a widely used source of accurate information for harmful algal blooms on Cayuga Lake. And further additions to the program this year include the publication of a Cayuga Lake harmful algal bloom information and reporting guide. Uh, in the form of a brochure. And these brochures have been stocked in weatherproof holders at six lakefront parks so far. And we hope that these brochures will serve as an important outreach tool to inform lake goers about harmful algal blooms, how to recognize them, and what to do if they encounter one. Uh, one additional uh, thing that we include in the program this year was testing a select number of blooms for anatoxin A. Uh, and our technical director, Noah Mark, will present on that uh, following this presentation. So blooms in 2020 were frequent and intense. Um, shown here is a daily count of harmful algal blooms that occurred on Cayuga Lake during the 2020 monitoring season. And in this chart, as in the ones to follow, we have classified the blooms by their microcystin toxin concentration. So gray represents blooms that we were not able to test for microcystin. Green represents blooms with a microcystin concentration below 0.3 micrograms per liter. Uh, black represents blooms with a microcystin concentration that exceeds 0.3 micrograms per liter, uh, but does not exceed the safe recreation limit for microcystin in water of four micrograms per liter. And red represents blooms with a microcystin toxin level that exceeded the safe recreation limit of four micrograms per liter, and in some blooms ranged as high as 1,500 micrograms per liter, or 300 times that, that limit. And you can see here that blooms occurred continuously throughout the summer of 2020, 
uh, and there were a great number of harmful algal blooms with high levels of microcystin toxin, again, shown by those red bars there. So where did blooms occur in 2020? Well, shown here is a map of all 78 harmful algal blooms that occurred in 2020. And the color again represents their microcystin toxin concentration. So as you can see, many high microcystin blooms occurred in the northern end of the lake from roughly the area around Union Springs, uh, north to where Shelley and Sai monitor, all the way to the outlet at the end of the lake. Uh, this section of the lake is where we observed uh, most of the blooms and where uh, the most blooms with high levels of microcystin toxin tended to occur. Um, however, in 2020, we saw something interesting where blooms with high microcystin concentrations also occurred at many other lakeshore locations, uh, such as on the shoreline of Stewart Park and East Shore Park down in Ithaca, as you can see by those uh, red dots way down there at the southern end of the lake. So thank you, and I'll now turn it over to our technical director, Noah Mark, to talk about anatoxin A testing. So hi everyone, I'm Noah Mark, I'm CSI's technical director. I typically work behind the scenes, uh, but today I'm here uh, to talk to you about uh, the anatoxin work we conducted last summer. So of the cyanotoxins that have been found in New York, uh, microcystin tends to get the most attention and rightfully so. It's been commonly found throughout water bodies in the state and at alarmingly high concentrations. However, from a management standpoint, anatoxin A might uh, be considered second in priority because of its association with animal deaths. In fact, uh, before anatoxin A was called anatoxin A, it used to be referred to as a causing agent with very fast death factor. Um, uh, we may have seen uh, this past June, uh, anatoxin A's deadly nature in action there were two dog deaths that occurred on Little Lake, uh, Little York Lake in Cortland. An autopsy of one of the dogs showed uh, that she had ingested a cyanotoxin. I couldn't find specifically in the, in the news which cyanotoxin, but from the owner's account, um, the dog went into a seizure and then she unfortunately passed within about 45 minutes. So that seems reminiscent of livestock deaths that have been linked to anatoxin A contaminated waters, but again, we can't know for sure. Um, another, besides its deadly nature and it being a neurotoxin, another reason why CSI was interested in looking at anatoxin A is it's known to be produced by a variety of cyanobacteria, including those of, that have dominated uh, blooms on Cuba Lake in our three years of monitoring. So one trait of this toxin um, is that it has a very short half-life and makes it difficult to sample because it degrades very rapidly in direct sunlight and high pH, which are kind of the natural conditions that uh, surface blooms are going to be exposed to. Um, so we doled out our usual amber glass bottles that we uh, give to our volunteers to collect HAB samples, but these, uh, to select volunteers, we gave them with uh, a preservative that acts as an acidic microbial inhibitor. And so volunteers collected samples from July to September. We got 19 samples in total and we tried to capture a variety of bloom compositions and then look at whether there's any association with um, anatoxin A and a single genus or genera. So as far as testing goes, um, we use the same antibody-based ELISA technology uh, for anatoxin A that's used to test for microcystin. Uh, we got a range of about 0.18 to 1.3 micrograms per liter and a median of about 0.4 uh, parts per billion or micrograms per liter. 
So looking at the microscopy analysis for these samples, the presence of anatoxin A doesn't appear to be associated with just one genus. We don't see that kind of tight correlation um, between toxin concentration and the presence of say microcystis like we do with microcystis and microcystin. So in looking at the concentrations that we got and trying to put it in context, um, we can certainly say that we saw low concentrations comp uh, compared to bloom concentrations of microcystin. However, when you get into what constitutes a dangerous level of anatoxin, it really depends on who you ask. Uh, currently, the EPA and New York State don't have guidance on, um, on anatoxin in ambient water. And then individual states like Ohio and Virginia, um, they can vary greatly on what poses a threat to recreational waters. So um, because of the uncertainty, the avoidance strategy prescribed by the state when encountering a suspicious bloom still applies. Like it, we don't fully know um, what could be there. Even if a bloom, say, tests low for microcystin, there could be another cyanotoxin present. And um, going forward, CSI may continue to sample and test for anatoxin A in the future. Um, it's partly commiserate with funding and interest, but I'll just leave it at that for now. And I'll pass the baton to Steve, who's going to talk about three-year trends. OK, thank you, Noah. I'm going to try my hand at screen sharing. Let's see. There we go. And oops. let me try this. There we go. Okay, I would like to talk about <clears throat> uh, and wrap up today's uh, presentations. Uh, by talking about the um, uh, about some of the patterns that we've observed in the three years that that uh, we've been monitoring Habs on Cayuga Lake, so the first pattern has already been mentioned. I'll just make it a little more explicit. The concentration of microcystin toxin in a harmful algal bloom is correlated with the presence of one particular type of cyanobacteria called microcystis, and uh, on this graph, uh, the dots represent Cayuga Lake HAB samples from the last three years. And the orange dots uh, are samples that are dominated uh, by, my, or were dominated by microcystis. And you can uh, see that familiar image uh, there to the, uh, to the right. And um, the blue dots are dominated by Dolichospermin uh, with little or no microcystis. And, an image of that is here. You saw that earlier in, in uh, Adriana's talk. And gray dots represent mixed assemblages of cyanobacteria that include uh, microcystis. So on the x-axis is the concentration of to total chlorophyll A, which is a measure of bloom density. And on the y-axis is the concentration of microcystin toxin. Uh, and as you can see, the denser the bloom, generally speaking, the higher the concentration of micro, microcystin toxin if the bloom contains microcystis. In other words, if it's a, a gray dot or an orange dot. But blooms that do not contain microcystis, like the dolichospermin bloom, uh, bloom shown by the blue dots, also contain little or no microcystin toxin. The second pattern uh, that we've noticed has to do with the frequency of HABs occurrences and their timing during the season. Uh, Nate described the uh, timing and frequency in 2020, uh, and I would like to go back a couple of years and, and, and uh, review uh, the frequency and timing uh, in 2018 and 2019. And that is shown in the graphs on the left. Uh, which um, show the daily counts of HABs in each year, 2018, 2019, and 2020, with uh, the date uh, on the x-axis and the number of HABs on the y-axis. And the, and the harmful algal blooms are color-coded, as has been described previously, uh, with, with gray not tested, green uh, less than the drinking water limit, 0.3 micrograms per liter, black uh, between 0.3 and 4 micrograms per liter, the recreation limit, and red 
uh, above the, um, the recreation limit of four micrograms per liter. <clears throat> and some of the uh, microcystin concentrations were as high as uh, 2,500 micrograms per liter, and um, that which is about 600 times the, the recreation limit. So as you can see from the uh, graphs on the left, uh, almost all of the, um, uh, the, the late season halves in 2018 or 2019 uh, contain microcystin above four micrograms per liter. Uh, and uh, uh, and that is a, re uh, a result of uh, 2018 and 2019. Uh, there were three general phases of uh, HABs occurrence. Uh, there was a cluster of HABs in July, a lull of several weeks in late July and August, and then an increase, uh, as I mentioned, in HABs in late August and September. And there were only a very few of the early season HABs that contained microcystin greater than four micrograms per liter, which is the recreation limit. Uh, but in 2018 and 2019, as I mentioned, virtually all of the late season HABs contained microcystin greater than four micrograms per liter. But now look at the bottom graph, uh, the, the, the pattern in 2020, it changed uh, and we saw uh, high microcystin HABs throughout uh, the season from July to September. Another uh, pattern uh, that uh, that changed is that um, is the number of high microcystin uh, HABs, and this graph shows the number of blooms in each microcystin category in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And as you can see, in 2018, there were 22 high microcystin blooms. In 2019, there were 28. And in 2020, there were 55, which is almost twice as many as, as uh, 2019 and 2018. So another change in 2020 was in the di distribution of high microcystin HABs around Cayuga Lake. And uh, the, the images, uh, on the map, uh, in this in this uh, uh, figure, uh, show the zones in gray that were patrolled by Habs Harrier volunteers and the number of each zone. The horizontal bars uh, indicate the number of harmful algal bloom samples that were analyzed in each zone, and their microcystin levels uh, again are color coded. So in 2019 and also in 2018, it's not shown. Uh, high microcystin halves were clustered along the northern roughly 20% of the shoreline. In 2020, this northern cluster was observed again, but in addition, high microcystin halves were found along the southern uh, roughly 80% of the Cayuga Lake shoreline, including Stewart Park and East Shore Park in Ithaca. You already saw the slide uh, in Adriana's talk. Uh, it's from the ecological track of our, uh, of our Cayuga Lake HABs monitoring program. Um, and it shows that uh, under non-bloom conditions, populations of microcystis um, become more dominant, became more dominant in the southern 80% of the lake shore in 2020 compared uh, to 2019. So this uh, suggests the correlation between the greater distribution or the more widespread distribution of high microcystin blooms in 2020 and the greater distribution of dense uh, non-bloom microcystis populations uh, uh, around the lake. But to be clear, this is a correlation. It's only a correlation. We can't say whether there is a cause and effect relationship. So to review during the past three years, Virtually all of the cyanobacteria blooms on Cayuga Lake with high microcystin exceeding the recreation limit were dominated by or contained significant concentrations of the genus microcystis. A large number of high microcystin blooms tend to occur each year in the northern fifth of Cayuga Lake uh, from Union Springs to the outflow of the northern marshes. In 2020, however, we also observed a number of high microcystin blooms around the southern four-fifths of the lake, which is consistent 
with a general increase in non-bloom uh, microcystis populations. So in closing, I'd just like to provide some context for our Cuyahoga Lake Habs monitoring program. I believe Nate already touched on this. Uh, our program fulfills many of the recommended uh, actions in the Cuyahoga Lake Habs action plan uh, published by DEC in 2018. Our community-led effort serves as a model, really, of uh, HABS uh, monitoring. And it's one of the few programs uh, that continues to test levels of uh, microsystem toxin following the DEC's withdrawal of support, financial support for microcystin testing. Uh, we are able to test for microcystin because, as uh, Nate and um, uh, Noah mentioned, the CSI lab is certified for EPF, EPA method 546. And <clears throat> because so far we've been able to raise enough money to do it, the tests are expensive. Uh, and finally, uh, we're proud of our HAPS reporting system. We think it's one of the fastest and most comprehensive in New York State. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Nate. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, so now we'll open it up to a discussion section and we will start that by uh, asking upon some of the folks who have asked questions so far to <laughs> unmute themselves and read their question aloud if they would like to. Uh, if they would like me to read their question, I'm happy to do so. Um, so Jim Long asked a question. Jim, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it, that would be great. Hey, Nate, can you stop the screen share maybe? <coughs> sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. You still here? You still? All right, well, I'll just, I'll ask it right now. This one might be a good one for Adriana. Uh, Jim wrote, can anyone say something about the bloom that lasted many weeks last summer in the pond at the boathouse in Stewart Park? Yeah, there was a big bloom there for quite a while. And I, hmm, a lot of times when we looked at what was happening over there, it wasn't necessarily cyanobacteria, but I think sometimes it was. And I'm sorry that I don't have my notes right here to um, look into that, but um, there were a lot of euglena too in, um, at different times. So it wasn't always cyanobacteria, um, but it looked pretty gnarly over there. and. Um, yeah, sorry. Does anyone else have anything else on that? Did we test any of those samples? Do you remember, Nate? Yeah, so we, we uh, ended up testing one of the samples from the Stewart Park Pond. You know, while it's not a lake sample from Cayuga Lake, we were just interested to see what was in there because it is in kind of a public area. Um, so it did have uh, low levels of microcystin toxin, so below the 0.3 uh, microgram per liter, that lower limit there. So low microcystin. Great. Uh, Douglas Merrill uh, had a great question. Uh, Douglas, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it, that would be great. Are people able to unmute themselves? Yeah, can, yeah, he shook his head. No. Oh, okay, here we go. Let me try this. There you go. Okay, am I unmuted? You are, yep. Yeah, I had a question for, um, for Adriana about how one differentiates the, the three levels of, of, of cyanobacteria. You had uh, sparse, moderate, and dense. Do you use a micrometer or, or how do you get to those differentiations? Yeah, so this is um, a little bit loose. Um, let me, but it's, okay, so the sparse is when I'm looking at a field, in a field of view of, I think it's 0.1 milliliters um, for the average drop that I'm looking at. Um, sparse is fewer than 10 individual colonies or clumps or filaments are present. So this is more, um, yeah, and, and then the sparse, let's see, moderate is more, more than 20 
individuals. So sometimes we have this sparse moderate where it was kind of in between like 10 to 20 colonies or clumps or filaments. Um, and then dense is, so more than, so moderate is more than 20, but it's under the field of view at any one point, you're not um, seeing a whole lot, right? And you have to actually look a little bit. You're not seeing them in every field of view. Dense is like when it's really clearly in just about every field of view, usually there's three or more um, colonies or clumps that are present. So yeah, we had to figure out a way without quantifying because that's a little bit difficult and it might be a little bit misleading because um, it's not an exact science using the plankton net out there. This is more of a sort of naturalist view of just taking a look at what we see at different places at different times. There are ways you can quantitatively look at plankton, um, but it requires uh, expensive equipment that we don't have at the lab right now and a lot of time as well to do that. So. Okay, thanks. All right, great. Uh, we had another question from Michelle Bamberger. Uh, Michelle, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it, that would be great. Um, uh, this is Robert Oswald. I, I'll answer. I'll ask the question. Um, I, I, it's really for Steve. Um, I was struck by the possibility that the microcystis blooms could have been correlated with the depth of the water. And uh, the second part of the question is, is, do you ever see any correlation between agricultural runoff and blooms? Was that for me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, correlation with agricultural runoff. Uh, I would say, well, first of all, we're not looking for it. And uh, uh, second, I think it would be hard to uh, determine uh, agricultural runoff goes into the streams, which goes, you know, which flow into Cayuga Lake. So one strategy would be to just look at the mouths of streams. Uh, we haven't done that, uh, you know, specifically. Uh, I'm not convinced that it that it would be worth the time and effort to do, but you know, that's something that 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 could be discussed and looked at. What was the other question, Robert? Is there a correlation between the blooms and the depth of the water? I think I'm going to leave that to somebody else. Uh, who would that be? Maybe Adriana? Would you be a good person to answer that question or Nate? I mean, I think some people are looking at, um, like, I mean, blooms tend to accumulate on the shoreline where it is shallower. Um, but they're are blooms that happen off of the Wells College Dock, which is near the deepest part of the lake. There are blooms that happen in the shallower north end of the lake and things move around. Um, so you, you, certainly when you have shallower water, it can be warmer temperatures, which are conducive to cyanobacteria. But I don't know, I, that's about all I could add, I guess. And I, I think it's, I think it's uh, also important to say that uh, our volunteers are collecting samples along the shoreline. So it is, <clears throat> so the water is not very deep. We do not try to sample for cyanobacteria out in Cayuga Lake. I mean, I guess it would be possible to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. And we, we ask Discover Cayuga Lake to, you know, if they see blooms to, you know, sample them, right, Nate? Uh, they're kind of part of our network. If they're out on the lake and see a bloom and have have the, 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 the time, you know, they can collect them. But by and large, it's a shoreline uh, bloom uh, um, surveillance program. That's right, yeah. Discover Cayuga Lake has been a great help with that. If there's any open water blooms and while they're out on the lake, uh, we welcome them to collect a sample of that and to report it. Uh, Cayuga Lake Environmental Action Now has also been very helpful with that effort. Uh, you know, while they're out on the lake doing research, helping to collect those open water blooms if they occur. Um, so we had a question from Jody Price. Uh, Jody, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it, that would be great. I, my question I think was <clears throat> maybe more like a, a, 
a, like a wow, I didn't know this, when Shelly and Cy, you were reporting that you had blooms that lasted 24 hours. And I didn't realize that they would do that. I thought they dissipated, <clears throat> excuse me, after, you know, the sun started to go down. Well, it, it does, I did. <laughs> uh, it does uh, get harder to detect any blooms as the sun goes down. Uh, I'm not sure what they're doing at that point, but when it occurs early the next day and came back with a vengeance the way that it did in that one uh, instance, I did have to, we did have to consult with Nate to determine, okay, is this a new bloom or a step or the same thing? And, and I think with some consultation, we decided that we'd wait 24 hours in between without a bloom before we would consider it a separate bloom. But it was definitely, the conditions were persisting. The wind was, was not, you know, the, usually when the wind kicks up, it does dissipate. But in these conditions, it was just very still and very hot and, and sunny during the day. So the conditions were right for it to persist, it seemed. That's good to know as I look for them in our area. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Great. Thank you. Tom St. Clair had a great question. Tom, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it, that would be great. Sure. Uh, uh, do we know if these types of blooms have been occurring for many years? Or, or, or are they something relatively new, like in the recent past? I, I just, I'm kind of wondering if they were going on for a couple hundred years, 500 years, two years. I, I don't really have a sense for that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's a hard one to answer. Uh, certainly because many of these kind of comprehensive harmful algal bloom monitoring programs really began in the last kind of decade or so. Um, and that's when we started to get this really good record of harmful algal bloom occurrence. Um, you know, I think that harmful algal blooms have occurred for a long time, um, although there, we don't have very many historic, you know, comprehensive records of them. Um, I might also open this up to any Habs Harriers or Lakeshore homeowners who are out there, uh, you know, if you remember these blooms happening in the past or not, um, or have any stories about that, you could unmute yourself and comment. I spent a lot of time in the lake when I was young and into my teenage years, and that would be the 60s and the 70s, my grandparents had a farm and we had a, a cottage on the lake below the farm. And I don't ever remember seeing anything like that, like what we're seeing now in, in, at that point. And that was across from um, the power, what we call the power plant in those days. Just from a plankton survey perspective, there are a few years in the past, in the early 1900s, and then some other years. Um, and most recently, I found a report for 2013 when some plankton surveys were done in the lake. And um, these were done every few weeks and it just really looked very different than um, what we see now when I look with the plankton surveys that we're doing. And it seems to be a phenomenon all over the world that's happening. These harmful algal blooms are increasing. And it's not always cyanobacteria, like the ones you hear about in Florida are dinoflagellates, and sometimes cyanobacteria are involved as well. Um, but yeah. And um, this is Ed Swayze. I, um, my grandparents <clears throat> owned land in Lansing, uh, a little piece of lakefront that they bought from relatives we had there um, in the 50s. And I started going up there in the 50s with them. And, and eventually my father took that over and then I took it over and I just <clears throat> sold it a couple of years ago to another family member. But um, my sense is that <clears throat> in those early years, there, this wasn't, um, wasn't obvious. It was, you didn't see much. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, <clears throat> 
we were ignorant to even be looking for it, of course. But, um, but I do th remember <clears throat> as I lived there for 15, 20 years, um, that we started to see it toward the end of that period. So um, we sold it um, in, uh, well, anyway, in the, in the oddies, um, early and mid oddies. <laughs> so um, I, I, I have a sense that it's just been a gradual increase. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, based on uh, kind of what we're starting to see through our blue monitoring program, I, I think we get a similar impression. Um, Joyce Leslie, you had some good questions. Joyce, would you like to unmute yourself and ask them? Yes, it, my name is Leslie Webster and we have a cottage just south of Taganic. Um, um, I'm, my question is why in the fall, like September and October, when the water's cooler and it's windier, why, why are there more microcystis then, than in the middle of July or August when it is hot and still? We've seen blooms and it's, all, it's usually been when a hot, a hot still day, once the wind comes up, we're good. So why has the level been so high the last two years in September, September and October? What could it be? Could it be the from Adriana? Could it be nutrients coming down the creeks because um, there's more rain and there's more nutrients out there at those times? I was just going to mention that water temperatures are still pretty warm at that time of year. It takes mm, not if you go in the lake; it's freezing in September. It's a lot cooler than August. Maybe not near the surface, but there's a definite cooling off, and after Labor Day. There's a definite cooling off. Yeah, um, one of the things that we've seen in our bloom record from the past three years is that uh, the, the, the types of cyanobacteria that we see in these blooms, uh, it seems somewhat seasonal in a sense, um, and maybe others can comment on this, uh, whereby, you know, in 2018 and 2019, we saw blooms that were dominated by Dalcospermum primarily in the in the early summer months, and then the the microcystis blooms would follow in like uh, late August and and September. Uh, so there could be kind of a, a seasonal succession factor even within the cyanobacteria community. Okay, yeah, and I want to add, I'm a fifth generation living on the lake, and it's definitely a lot different than it used to. Be. Um, I don't know when people started noticing these, but I had never seen them growing up. Yeah, it's concerning. Uh, John Dennis, you had a great question. John, would you like to unmute yourself and ask it? Sure, thank you, Nate. Uh, you know, I thought of a second question. So the first question was just, uh, do does do the folks at CSI think that water temperature, warmer water temperatures and phosphorus are the key drivers of blooms on the lake? And my second thought was if we could invite Tom Vorder to comment why uh, Onondaga Lake hasn't had any serious blooms, whereas Q the Lake has. I don't know if you'd be willing to comment on that. So, uh, so the. The, the first question, John, could you repeat it, please? Sure, just uh, do you consider that warmer water temperatures and phosphorus, uh, you know, higher levels of phosphorus are the key drivers of blooms on the lake? Well, I mean, I, I think it's generally accepted that both of those are, are, are drivers, you know, temperature and, and, and nutrients, particularly phosphorus, but whether they, whether they're key drivers on Cayuga Lake in particular, I mean, we can't say that. We, we don't have any, any, any evidence to, uh, to support a, a key role on Cayuga Lake. But in general, yes, absolutely, temperature and phosphorus are, are very important. But having said that, it's, a, uh, you know, it's important to realize that not, that not Phosphorus concentrations, elevated phosphorus concentrations, do not necessarily result in harmful algal blooms. And 
and low concentrations do not, of phosphorus do not necessarily exclude harmful algal blooms. And, and I think the, the, the poster child for that second scenario was uh, Skinny Atlas Lake, right? Uh, very low phosphorus concentrations, and yet a few years ago, at least, they had uh, a lot of blooms. So it's, it's, they are drivers, but it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, correlation. And now I'll turn it over to Tom. <clears throat> Hi, am I, am I unmuted? Yes, I should be. I, that's an interesting question about uh, the relationship between ni nitrogen and phosphorus in uh, causing blooms. Onondaga Lake, uh, historically, was notoriously prone to uh, harmful algal blooms in the late summer and, and autumn. Uh, I was at one point considered the most polluted lake in the country, I think. But in the process of, of solving those problems, the um, Metro the wastewater treatment plant in Syracuse, which was the source of many of the nutrients entering the lake, introduced a process that um, got rid of the ammonia that was going into the lake, which is a toxin, of course, to most things, converting it into nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen. Now that uh, cyanobacteria, some of them, as I, I think Adriana pointed out, have the ability to fix nitrogen uh, from its rather unavailable state in the atmosphere and, there's, and therefore dissolved in the water. And by that means, they, they gain some advantage over the other kinds of algae, the competitive advantage over the other kind of algae in the lake. But there's been this sort of rule of thumb that as long as the nitrogen uh, to phosphorus ratio was less than 29 to 1, I think, uh, that that ad advantage didn't, uh, to the, excuse me, that that advantage to the cyanobacteria didn't uh, uh, didn't occur. But once the, the nitrogen to phosphorus level got greater than that, in other words, as, as the relative amount of phosphorus increased, excuse me, relative amount of nitrogen increased, uh, the cyanobacteria lose their competitive advantage and uh, har harmful algal blooms are less likely to appear. Kind of a complicated answer, and I'm not sure it's held up. But, but the issue in Onondaga Lake right now is it has a very high uh, nitrogen to phosphorus level because of this uh, increase in nitrogen from the sewage treatment plant. It's well over 100 to 1 at this point. Thank you, yeah, those great answers to that question. Uh, Kathy Quitt has a question. Kathy, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it, that would be great. Thank you. Um, we have cho grandchildren down quite often, and um, it's obvious when the water's dark green that there's an algae bloom, but how do we know when it's safe for them to enter the water and swim again? We've just been going by color. Yeah, that's a really tough question and something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, what I'll give you an idea of kind of what the New York State Parks do for, uh, you know, how they manage swimming at public beaches. So what they do is that they wait 24 hours after a bloom has dissipated, has completely gone from the shoreline. Um, so no swimming within 24 hours of the last sighting of the bloom. And then they collect a sample uh, and test it for microcystin to make sure it's below that four microgram per liter limit. And then if it is, um, then they uh, reopen the beach for swimming. Uh, so I guess what I would say, you know, it's always never, you know, go swimming when there's obvious signs of a bloom. Um, and, you know, following their lead, a good rule of thumb, maybe, you know, even waiting 24 hours uh, after a bloom has uh, cleared. Thank you. Um, it looks like John Abel has a question. John, if you'd like to unmute and ask, that would be great. Yeah, it, um, I have a kind of a naive question, um, but uh, I was just wondering 
with climate change, we're seeing increases in CO2 concentrations in the air and probably in the water. <laughs> and uh, I wondered whether the levels of CO2 might have any influence on uh, uh, blooming of uh, the algae in the sense that they consume it and convert it to oxygen. So it is, uh, it's the input to photosynthesis. So uh, I, I don't know whether anyone has thought about that or ruled it out or whether the, the levels of concentration are so unvariable uh, that, it, it, that it's not a factor. Sounds like a good project. You up for it? <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question. You yeah, can test well, it in the lab. It, 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 I wondered, for example, whether in midsummer, uh, when the trees are uh, very busy photosynthesizing and that they're competing for the CO2, and in the fall when they're declining, uh, that maybe the CO2 concentrations go up because there's less competition for it. That's a difficult one to answer, yeah, but certainly something that I think we should uh, put some attention towards. Yeah, I, I think it relates to a larger question that some of us have who are harriers. Uh, as to whether the, there should be other things that we're measuring when we sample, such as uh, water temperature uh, and things like that. I, I, I don't think there's easy ways to monitor CO2 concentration, but, um, but uh, I, you know, I just, uh, we have this wonderful experiment going on with lots of input and uh, and yet we may be missing some important parts of the data is uh, my thought. Yeah, John, uh, we've, we've uh, uh, often talked uh, in, in, uh, in, in our lab at CSI about measuring temperature, also about measuring nutrients uh, in, in blooms. Nutrients are, uh, that, that's, uh, you know, really, really tough to do. Uh, accurately or, or meaningfully because the the algae them, or the, the cyanobacteria themselves contain nutrients so you know when you when you uh, how, how do you separate the the nutrients in the ambient water in a bloom from the nutrients in the cyanobacteria which have begun to die and release nutrients by the time uh, they're collected and brought to the lab and certainly after they're processed in the lab uh, so, so that's a so nutrient analysis of blooms. I think is 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 tricky. Um, as far as temperature goes, yes, that's a much more accessible uh, parameter. Uh, I think the nutrients. Uh, but again, to do that meaningfully, um, I mean, you'd have to measure. We, we'd have to devise a protocol for temperature measurement that is uh, reproducible. Uh, among you know all the volunteers, and have thermometers that will presumably give accurate measurements. I don't know within tenths of a degree, perhaps. Um, that I'm not sure that's necessary, but it. But you'd think that small temperature fluctuations might be important. And uh, one possibility that we've talked about is having a, a continuous um, temperature. Uh, logger, let's say, at, at, at one location on one dock or, or a couple of docks. I believe they're doing that over on Seneca Lake. Uh, I don't know what the results are. Maybe somebody else knows, but uh, they are doing uh, something like that in their HABS program on Seneca Lake. So those are really good questions, really good thoughts. It's just, um, it, but, but it's hard to do, you know, hard to do well. And um, just to piggyback off of Steve's comments, um, you know, most of us are interested in the conditions leading up to a balloon, which, you know, as we all know, these things are really difficult to forecast where they're going to, where they're going to occur. So that's, that's just another uh, piece of the puzzle, I guess, you know, we could look at, we could get data from, you know, 
the like the the matrix that the blooms are occurring in. But I think a lot of us are interested more in like what's the conditions that lead up to this uh, population explosion that occurs. And yeah, it's just really hard to uh, logistically very hard to do. So yeah. Um, yeah, should we move on to the next question? Sure. Um, Please do. Can, can you hear me? Uh, we're going to move on to... Hello? Uh, Noah? Alex. Hey, Alex. Hey. Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. We can... Hey, so sorry, I just uh, butted in. Uh, I'm, I'm Alex, a uh, senior analyst at uh, CSI. I just, uh, can I quickly uh, comment on the uh, CO2 question? Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so uh, if we think of the kind of uh, input and output of, of CO2, I mean, I mean, in general, uh, uh, globally, uh, right? So we see an increase of CO2, uh, hence uh, global warming. So um, means that our input of CO2 is uh, greater than uh, whatever the uh, trees and cyanobacteria can kind of consume uh, in terms of... Uh, um, their uh, uh, photosynthesis. So uh, it would be probably uh, 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 unlikely that uh, CO2 is a limiting factor in that sense. Great, thanks for your input, Alex. Um, there's two questions here. Maybe uh, Steve, if you wanna take a stab at these. Um, uh, someone asks, are you sampling for anything besides algae, such as other bacteria and E. coli? And is there an increase in blooms near outfalls, or is there no correlation? Um, so are we sampling and testing for other uh, microorganisms? Uh, well, uh, first, Adriana, of course, is surveying micro phytoplankton, all different types of um, eukaryotic and prokaryotic uh, phytoplankton. Uh, we do uh, test for E. coli. We uh, team up with Discover Cayuga Lake and go out on uh, two or three eco cruises, monitoring cruises uh, each summer. And one of the parameters that we measure at, at uh, seven different locations on the lake where we uh, sample is E. coli. So yes, we are measuring E. coli on the lake and the levels are quite low, uh, 235 colonies per 100 ml is the limit for uh, recreational swimming, uh, contact recreation, and uh, as far as I know, all, all of the concentrations on Cayuga Lake are well below that limit. Um, so uh, that's the answer to that question. What was the rest of the question, please? Or the other question, the second one? The other half of the question, um, or I guess, different question is, is there an increase in blooms near outfalls uh, or is there no correlation? I'm not aware of any correlation. Uh, outfalls, you probably mean outfalls of wastewater treatment plants. Um, and uh, actually our Habs Harriers would probably be the best ones to answer that because they're the ones that, you know, patrol uh, the shoreline and they know where the wastewater treatment plants are, the outfalls, uh, generally speaking. Um, just a, a, a quick comment, there are two wastewater treatment plant outfalls at the south end of Cayuga Lake, both of them in the, basically the center, the middle of the, uh, of the shallow southern shelf. As far, again, we do not test uh, or, or as, as a pool sample for um, HABs in open water in Cayuga Lake. Uh, that said, I'm not aware of blooms uh, above or near those outfalls uh, or uh, above or near the uh, lake source cooling outfall, which we also monitor. Um, so, but Habs Harriers, uh, what, what say you? <laughs> you're, you're the ones that are patrolling the lake. You, you have firsthand uh, observations. <laughs> Hard to say. We don't, yeah. we don't have any. We don't have any outfalls here. <laughs> oh, uh, at some point, I guess uh, all of these little homes had 
their own septic systems, but we converted to public water and sewer uh, over five years ago, I guess. We've only been here for about five years, by the way, so. Uh, and we've seen a, a, it seems like a dramatic increase in the HABs in our experience. Of course, we're more closely monitoring it too, but right. anyway, I, I would be able to comment about outfalls. Right, and as far as wastewater from on-site septic systems, uh, we do uh, team up with the uh, West Shore uh, Neighborhood Association, uh, and they collect samples uh, several times a year at about 16 or 18 locations along the West Shore, uh, Southwest Shore of Cayuga Lake from uh, Ithaca up to uh, almost the Seneca County line or maybe a little beyond the concentrations of E. coli at those locations are very low, you know, and if, and that suggests that uh, leakage from on-site septic systems is, is minimal or, or, or non-existent, or at least not a problem, at least not enough to uh, uh, generate E. coli uh, along the, uh, the Southwest shore. So I don't know if you can extrapolate that to the rest of the shoreline, uh, but the evidence that we have from that small stretch of Cayuga Lake shoreline suggests that there is not a problem with uh, on-site septic systems possibly, uh, you know, feeding nutrients into blooms. Great. Well, we've kind of reached our time here, uh, but I want to say thank you for participating today and for all the wonderful questions that you sent us. We still have some more, uh, and so we will get to those questions following this webinar. Uh, we'll respond to you via email. And I'd also like to welcome any other questions that people didn't get the chance to ask today. Uh, please just send us an email at the Community Science Institute, and we would love to discuss it with you. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we really appreciate your support and your interest, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.